endless open ocean, full of mysteries. They are among the most fascinating of all ocean creatures, sharks, and the lifelong research subjects of a man who knows them like no other. Professor Samuel Gruber. He's been researching sharks for more than 50 years. How do sharks live? What social structures do they have, if any? Gruber is looking for answers to these and many other questions. And in order to understand them, it's best to live amongst them. A school of white tip reef sharks. They're still resting. But during the night, they hunt together. Gruber knows their ways. Sam Gruber is about to board a flight to Bimini Island in the Bahamas. Sam is taking a group of fellow scientists to Bimini from Fort Lauderdale. More than 20 years ago, Sam Gruber built the Bimini Biological Field Station, also called the Shark Lab in the Bahamas, as a center for intense field research on Atlantic shark species. Scientists around the world have been taking special notice of his methods and results. Sam is tireless. Sam uses every minute he has. The flight offers him a great opportunity to read up on past research and plan his day once he gets to the shark lab. The late 70s, on a research vessel owned by the Oceanographic Department of the University of Miami, a hammerhead shark is being pulled on board. Back then, Sam Gruber and his team were researching the shark's eyes. The eyesight of the sharks always played a secondary role because most researchers assumed that they have terrible eyesight. Now we know it's quite the opposite. Most shark species protect their eyes from light or injury with a nictitating membrane. The size and positioning of the eyes can be quite different, depending on the shark species. Lemon sharks especially are great for this kind of research. It's not always easy to hold on to them, even for Gruber, who's very experienced in handling the sharks. This shark will have to take an eye test in the next tank. Gruber had already developed a special eye test for his research back then. He was able to prove that some shark species don't only see color, but also have great vision at night. The lemon shark can cover its pupil extremely fast once light hits it. Gruber was able to find out that shark eyes are very sensitive to light, but don't have great focus depth. They're permanently set to infinity. Lemon sharks off the coast of Florida. They're calmly resting on the ocean floor. These are pregnant females. They mate in the late spring, and then it takes a year until they give birth. But what are they doing here? And why are they so calm? Gruber found out that the pregnant females use the warm waters of the Gulf Stream as their safe haven. They separate themselves from the males after they've mated. I'm gonna take this one right out. These pictures went viral. Sam Gruber acting as shark midwife. He helped this female lemon shark give birth close to his research station. The mother was too weak to give birth on her own. To protect the scientists, the female was tied to the boat while giving birth. She had five babies that Sam helped into the world. Off they go. Bimini Island is located around 50 miles east of Miami. This small island separated into North and South Bimini is the most northern of the Bahamian Islands and a mecca for divers and sport fishermen. 
The mangroves are the most valuable asset these islands have. It's a unique habitat and nursery for many ocean inhabitants, especially sharks. Well, we were... Bimini is Sam's second home, and these mangroves are the main research location for him. We're here to follow him and document his latest research. The mangroves offer a great home to several different shark species, as long as they are juveniles. Hideouts and protective areas are all part of the mangroves, and it also offers a place where the animals can mate in peace and quiet. These nurse sharks have found each other. Meanwhile, the Gulf Stream offers warm water and a continuous supply of food. Eagle rays have also found a home here. Their pectoral fins swing like wings. Their long tail is whip-like and quite dangerous. These 12-foot male nurse sharks are following one female. They're much larger than the females and like the shallower regions. It could take hours until a couple finds each other. The males are always in the majority and therefore often have to fight for a female. This one uses all its charm and seems to be successful. They're getting closer to each other. The females are very choosy and take their time. This remora has no patience for shark flirting. It's busy cleaning a stingray that has found a cozy place in the sand where it can hide. There's an abundance of fish all around Bimini. It's especially good for the juveniles that will arrive here soon. They're inching closer and closer to each other. Not even the remoras disturb them now. Will we be able to film the mating? We're on standby. And then all of a sudden it happens. The male nurse shark becomes active. He has to hold on to the female and bites her pectoral fin. He'll continue to do that until he has a good hold of her. There's no romance here. Shark mating can end bloodily at times. Sometimes the females even die afterwards because their wounds become infected through fish bites. The male has to turn the female on her side or turn her over all the way. It's quite a challenge for him. That's why he has two penis-like clasper organs, only one of which he will finally use. It only works if the male is parallel to the female. The actual mating only takes minutes. Those who don't get their chance can always try again after a few minutes rest. Caribbean reef sharks are all around Bimini. These gray predators can grow up to nine feet long. There are thousands of snappers here. They're sought after delicacies for sharks and humans alike. The snappers are still safe. The sharks will not hunt until it's night time. A pod of dolphins is traveling through the area. Two of the acrobats show off their skills.
Similar to the sharks, the dolphin females also use the shallow regions around Bimini to give birth. The dolphin baby is born while the mother continues to swim. Pictures like these are therefore extremely rare and pure luck. There are only a handful of scientists that have as much experience with shark research as Samuel Gruber. Together with the young biologists, Kate and Steve, he prepares for an excursion to the tiger sharks. Tarpons are busy huddling together underneath the boat. The silver torpedo-like fishes can grow up to seven and a half feet. Sam has plans other than the tarpons. Together with his team, he's on his way to Ayers Rock. After a 20-minute boat ride, they meet up with the team that caught a young tiger shark during the night. This is an ideal research candidate for Gruber. In order to get better insights into the behavior of these sharks, they'll be tagged with a transmitter. It's not an easy task because the animal is very strong. The transmitter is fastened to the dorsal fin of the shark in a way that does not injure the shark. Make a hole in him first. It's the best you can do. Sam Gruber pushes his team because the shark needs to be released soon. The cartridge will come loose soon, but the transmitter will stay. A young lemon shark is being prepped for a stomach examination. This is called stomach eversion. It's actually a natural process because the shark will expel something that it can't digest in exactly the same way. The biologists want to find out what kind of fishes and how many these juveniles feed on in the mangroves. The shark seems a bit out of it when it gets back in the water. The examination was very exhausting for the animal. The biologists help him recover quickly by feeding him oxygen, and the animal returns to normal very soon after. Here it's obvious that the shark actively breathes in the oxygen by opening and closing its mouth. The protection of the sharks is Sam's main objective. He needs to know exactly where and how the animals live and what they feed on in order to help them be protected. The shark lab has a large fenced-in area off the beach for field research. A young tiger shark is about to be caught, but it's not making it easy for them. It's always a challenge to catch these sharks, even for these very experienced scientists with their dip nets. Sam has no fear of the shark. He tries to handle this shark with his bare hands. All right, rotate it back, rotate it back. I've got a hold of it while you do that. All right, there we go. He's obviously very experienced and quickly turns the shark on its back. Once the shark is turned over, it goes into tonic immobility and can be handled easily. Get it on the fork. OK. OK. All right, go, go to the pit. Sam holds the shark in position long enough for his team to measure the animal without danger. Is the tiger shark large enough for its age? One. One-seven. The shark is completely motionless during the entire examination. Are you ready? Yep. It just feels so amazing. Gruber holds the shark no, 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 just no, no, underneath no, no, no. the surface no, 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 no. so that it can breathe easily. Yeah, please touch his tail and he'll get frightened. I've got it. All right. You're good. Okay, total length, one-four-seven. This tiger shark is about four and a half feet long, and the team is happy with that. Okay, fine. All right, guys, look, now the I'm shark is also being tagged with a transmitter. Is this uh, system all ready to go? Yeah, we should be set All right, up get ready now. All right. The transmitter that the biologists attach to the tiger shark seems to be working fine. The scanner detects a signal. 
Grab the other net. Come on in. Pull it out, pull it out. Sam explains to Kate step by step how to attach the transmitter to the dorsal fin of the shark without injuring the animal. It's obviously not easy. One, two, three, go. A quick push and that's it. The transmitter is attached and the shark doesn't feel anything. It's already swimming away right past the camera of our cameraman, Ralph Steinberg. All right, net people, fall back. Net people, fall back. Push the boat to the shark. And off it goes back to freedom. The team released the shark outside the pen. Where will it go? The biologists will follow this shark from now on because they want to know its destination and whether it stays around and for how long. Make believe you're tracking them, guys. Make believe you're tracking them. The tiger shark leads the team directly into the mangroves. Sam knows that they stay here for about three years. The boat does not fit through here. Sam has brought us to a magical place. It's tough not to misstep and get stuck in the roots. What looks too tight for us to squeeze through is in fact the perfect spot for juvenile lemon and tiger sharks. They're all around us and they don't seem to pay us any particular attention. Sam knows every path, but he doesn't want to frighten the sharks away and therefore moves forward slowly. Here we go. Here we go. We're going to be able to walk better now in a few minutes. Aya's spot is the name of this place, and we're almost there. Okay, there's another one, yeah. Gruber and his team are now in the middle of the nursery of the lemon and tiger sharks. Sam lures the juveniles with fish pieces. It's the only way to get them close enough to catch in order to measure and tag the babies. Yeah, right here, right here, right here. Here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. Right. Look out, look out, It's not quite without danger because even the young ones can bite. You got him? I got him, I got him, I got him. Good, good, good. Nevertheless, it's not as easy as it looks to catch a juvenile shark. All right, we got it. Oh, they're really coming in now. Look, there's several of them over there. There's a real one there. One has made a beeline for his boots. There's two coming in now, Doc. You go okay. left, I'll go right. All right. More and more sharks sense the food that's in the water. There's a reason for this. The team has positioned itself so that the current flows out towards the sharks and with it the scent of the bait. Okay. All right, here All right. it comes, here it comes. Go to it! Finally, a larger juvenile lemon ends up in the dip nets and fights back. Not easy for the team. Got him. Got him. Got him. Got him. Got him. Got him. All right, we got one in there. Cool. Sam knows exactly how to handle the lemon shark. Well, Nevertheless, nice it's still it's tough male, for him. It? Yeah, male. All right. Little male. Cool. Little male. All right. Good. 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 Without anybody noticing, another family member stops by. Better safe than sorry, the shark can bite onto the handle of the dick net. It's fighting hard, and the biologists would rather it bite into the pole than their hands. And this is how to calm a shark. Ideal for the cameraman. Okay, so we got a male. Gruber is wondering which shark this is. Last year, the biologists tagged this one, and now they can find out which one it is and where it's been with the help of the scanner. Another step. The biologists take a DNA sample. It will later be examined in the lab and the data recorded. The small hole it left will heal quickly. No problem for the shark. Just a small piece of the pectoral fin is enough good for the one. DNA That's a good sample. One right there. Yeah. Good one. 
Sam looks tense, but is happy with the results. Tristan, why do you take the DNA samples of the sharks? So we take the sample, we take it back to the lab, and then determine how many females and how many males contribute to the population and basically build a big family tree for sharks. Gruber's shark research is unique. He has a passion for sharks and constantly fights for their survival. Okay. Almost done. It needs to be weighed. Lift it up. Yeah. All right, got it. 2.7, Yeah, that's All right, 2.7. Okay, good. He's uh, Not yeah, bad. Really Almost six pounds. Right. Got him? Got him. Okay. Enough for today. Tomorrow is another day. And they have enough data for now. Sam has caught another shark because Natalie wants to know more about tonic immobility. So when you flip them over, they can't become completely motionless. Right, right, right. He's... Uh, He's uh, now in tonic immobility. OK. And you reverse it immediately when you flip him back yeah, right side up? Yeah, he'll swim okay. away like that. OK, all right. And off he goes. A long work day nears its end. Unfortunately, not for the biologists. They will continue as soon as it gets dark. Sometime after midnight, the waves are quite high. The weather has turned and a strong southwesterly wind blows into the biologists' faces. They hardly notice because their attention is on the fully grown tiger shark that they caught on their long line. Gruber pays close attention because a mistake made by anybody on the team could be catastrophic. They pull the very large predator towards the boat with a rope in order to measure the animal. It's essential for everybody to pay close attention to the animal's behavior and be extra careful. A fully grown tiger shark can measure up to 17 feet. Tiger sharks are second in line behind the even more dangerous bull sharks in the famous shark attack file. What are you doing now? What are you doing? Wait a minute, wait a minute. This tiger shark will also receive a transmitter. Gruber will leave nothing to chance. As soon as the shark calms down, the biologists spring to action. The transmitter is attached to the animal's dorsal fin. What is it that makes Bimini so unique for shark research? Female lemon sharks come to Bimini Island because they have a wonderful mangrove habitat for the babies to give birth and grow up in. These mangroves provide both food and protection for these youngsters. The mothers know this, evolutionarily speaking, because they themselves were born here, and they come back to the same place that they were born. So it's a perfect situation. A change of location. We set course towards the Little Bahama Bank. It's a submerged plateau made of limestone on which the Bahama Islands sit. The water is crystal clear and only 18 feet deep. Lemon sharks are the first to show up. As with the great white sharks, fully grown lemon sharks can be very dangerous. There have been numerous attacks on divers or beachgoers. There are many different theories as to why these attacks happen, but in the end it's always the human that trespasses into their habitat, not the other way around. Shark researchers know they live with that danger. Female lemon sharks especially come to the Little Bahama Bank surrounded by the warm waters of the Gulf Stream. During his research, Gruber has been able to prove that lemon sharks react especially to bright colors such as yellow or orange. Therefore, dive operators who dive in these shark-infested waters ask their clients to dress all in black. Even the lemon sharks are in danger of being caught here. Deep-sea sport fishermen follow the predators out to the banks.
Lemon sharks feed on anything. They will devour octopuses just as readily as seabirds or even other sharks. They hunt primarily during the night. Remoras are the constant companions of sharks. They attach themselves with their suction plates to the sharks, who are not always happy about it. But in return, the remoras free the sharks from irksome parasites. Lemon sharks can live for up to 20 years and weigh up to 440 pounds. We reach the banks with the sun racer. We want to learn more about the lemon sharks, but they won't be the only ones that are around. About 20 of the lemons greet us as we are trying to get into the water. We use a small pole cam to take these shots. Unfortunately, not for long, because it gets destroyed in the process. Oh, wow. oh Ed, they got it. It's got a scratch up here, they got it. It still worked, and camerawoman Natalie is quite happy with these first shots. But this is only the beginning. four divers on the back deck and about 70 sharks. Not something for people with weak nerves, but it is a unique opportunity to get great shots of the lemon shark's life and behavior. Also on Natalie's team is the shark expert, Jim Abernathy. Nevertheless, this is not an everyday dive for any of them. While the team is busy with the final preparations on board, they're already being expected underwater. The lemon sharks smell the chum and come right to the boat. The tanks are full, the equipment has been checked, and the cameras are on standby. The team is ready to go. Pure excitement. But lemon sharks are not the only ones waiting down here. There's also a 15-foot tiger shark. It's important to stay calm now and always keep an eye on the animal and make no sudden movements. It doesn't take long, and the giant tiger shark finds Natalie especially interesting. Jim is immediately by her side and intervenes. He shows how confident he is in handling these giant ocean inhabitants and gently pets the shark's wide mouth. He puts himself in grave danger by doing so. One wrong movement, and it will turn into a catastrophe. His efforts reward us with incredible footage of the lemon sharks that don't seem to care much about any of us down here. And another very curious one is heading straight for Natalie, but turns away at the last minute. Again, there are mostly females here. They may have mated in Florida and come here to relax. Tiger shark is back. Tiger sharks are considered to be among the most dangerous sharks in the oceans. But how aggressive is this animal really? Scientists are still at odds over this question. But the fact is that there continue to be accidents with this animal. Lemon sharks can also be found in the Pacific, not just here in the Atlantic. They also don't seem to have a problem adjusting to fresh water, as they have been found in the Amazon.
Bramoras are fighting for the best sharks. It reminds us of a taxi stand in a large city. If they're too late, they will miss their ride. Luckily, there are enough sharks here to go round. It seems that these two have missed their ride. Maybe the camera team will give them a lift. Remoras live on the edge, so to speak, because if they're not careful, they'll end up being dinner. This one has found success. A tiger shark lets the remora ride with him. The eponymous pattern on the back of the shark can be clearly seen now. Pelagic sharks, such as the great whites, have to continue to swim in order to secure their oxygen supply. Lemon sharks don't. This lemon shark is resting on the sand. It opens and closes its mouth continuously. The animal is breathing actively. For the longest time, scientists held the belief that all sharks have to constantly swim in order to breathe. Obviously not true. The waters around the Little Bahama Bank seem to be an intact and untouched habitat for the sharks. Or is that an illusion? We'll get to that later. Even the tiger shark seems to be used to the divers now, or is it? The shark is coming closer and closer. The large black eye is very prominent on tiger sharks. Danger averted? The striped giant has found something better, the boy of the scientists. It starts biting into it, and we immediately understand why tiger sharks are also referred to as the garbage disposal units of the oceans. Things such as car tires, shoes, and plastic bottles have been found in their stomachs. This tiger shark does not pose any danger to us, for now. But then the shark decides differently. The giant comes back and heads for our camera woman. She's holding her breath because she knows that the footage she's getting will be incredible. These kinds of shots are quite unusual. Jim comes to the rescue again, but it takes some effort. Shark attacks often end fatally because the animals will take off a limb with one bite of their razor-sharp teeth and the victim will bleed to death. The danger is not over yet because the animal comes back towards the camera woman. One punch with the elbow is enough, but it could have ended very differently. The tiger shark has had enough for today and withdraws. And the camera team also feels that it's time to surface and finish up. But then there's a surprise. A lionfish. It's not supposed to live in the Caribbean and therefore has no natural enemies here. Nobody really knows how they got to this part of the world and scientists are already talking about an ecological catastrophe. The spines on the lionfish's back, tail and pectoral fins contain poison that they use for their own protection. The sharks therefore leave this invader alone. The groupers see a food competitor in the lionfishes, but nevertheless have no defense towards this intrusion. Several feet away, a group of lionfishes have taken over this reef. 
As always in such cases, humans are to blame for the lionfish's invasion. Public aquariums sometimes accidentally release a species into another ocean where they don't belong. The team finishes up knowing that they have great shots of the lemon and tiger sharks, and nobody got hurt. That's not always the case. In South Africa, these two divers were trying to film great white sharks from the protection of a shark cage and almost lost their lives despite the cage. They are spectacular and frightening pictures of a shark attack. The animal forges into the cage and tears it apart, meanwhile locking the tourists into the one place where they should have been safe. They're able to free themselves in the last second and come out uninjured. How can humans protect themselves against shark attacks? It's an age-old question and continues to occupy scientists. The New York native Eric Stroud, for example. Stroud and Gruber would both like to reduce the number of sharks that are caught as bycatch on long lines, as well as to find an efficient way of protecting people from shark attacks. Stroud has developed a chemical and both scientists are eager to try it out on their test subjects. This small bottle contains a chemical that's supposed to chase away sharks, but not have any influence on other fishes. Stroud sprays a small dose of it into the water, and the hungry nurse shark withdraws immediately. It doesn't last very long, and the sharks come back hungry for the bait. Another try. Eric Stroud knows that he will be injured if one of the sharks bites his hand. This dummy hand contains a fish, and the sharks are therefore drawn towards it. They start acting more and more wildly. Within seconds, the shark starts biting into the dummy hand. Now Eric has to react quickly, but he's too slow. Sam changes the technique and has put the shark into tonic immobility. Eric can take more time and doesn't have to use the chainmail gloves. This test is very important for his research. Very slow, it's still moving. Nice closed. It works. And all the shark wants to do now is get away from it. What does that mean? His eye closed. Sam also feels that this shark repellent works. So much so that they're ready to test it in the open ocean. Eric has tinkered a bit with the dosage of the chemical, and Sam lures the reef sharks towards the boat with bait. We have here about 10 Caribbean reef sharks. One of them is very big, beautiful one, and it has a tag on it. A larger group of reef sharks takes advantage of this sudden and unexpected meal. This test is very important for Eric Stroud. If he can make this work, he'll be able to sell his chemical to fishing fleets, dive shops, and lifeguards worldwide. Big business for his fledgling enterprise. The test is simple. Lure them in first and then chase them away. As soon as the cartridge hits the water, it opens up and spews the repellent. The sharks take off as soon as they smell it. Get them! Get the sharks now! Notice that there's fish right there feeding. When the sharks were there, the fish were gone. We threw the repellent and the, the sharks disappear. They try to come back in and they still disappear. Surfers and swimmers especially are prone to shark attacks all over the world. Has Eric Stroud been able to find a way to stop these attacks before they become deadly? The mysteries of sharks don't always have to be solved in the ocean. Here in Gainesville, Florida, there are many of them to uncover. Documentary producer Natalie Tesha Ricciardi is visiting Gordon Hubble. Not only the sharks' mouths hang open here, 
The former director of the Miami Zoo owns the largest shark jaw collection in the world. He's considered to be the most knowledgeable expert on the history and lifestyle of sharks. I used to think the males had narrower teeth and bigger teeth, but that's not true. Gordon Hubble owns shark teeth and jaws from the most exotic species. He's also considered to be the expert on fossilized and prehistoric shark species. Gordon is also a taxidermist and works on all of the jaws and teeth himself. Currently, he's preparing a megalodon jaw, the great-grandfather of all shark species. These teeth were found in Denmark. This is how the megalodon looked when he lived in our oceans 10 million years ago. Large extinct sharks are Hubble's speciality. He's able to determine what these 100,000 pound sharks fed on according to their teeth. We leave Florida and set course towards Cocos, a small island off the Central American coast. The tropical volcanic island is located approximately 270 nautical miles off the Costa Rican coastline and has very lush vegetation. Many myths surround this island. Pirates were supposed to have hidden their treasure here. The underwater life around Cocos is very abundant, and therefore many dive operators offer expensive and exclusive dive safaris to the island. Cocos is famous for its large schools of fish. These hammerhead sharks find a full buffet all year round. Their unusually shaped head gives them a clear advantage while hunting for prey. They can maneuver better. And large schools of mackerel are at the top of their list of favorite foods. A rare wahoo. A school of mackerel hunting. Amongst them, cameraman Florian Grana, who's surrounded by Galapagos sharks. These are what we came for, white tip reef sharks. Hundreds of them live around the volcanic island. They're surprisingly active now because they usually lie around dozing on the ocean floor during the day and hunt at night. Something seems to be different. The white tip reef sharks are extremely agile because of their slender body shape. They can hunt in small caves. Very few other shark species have perfected this technique as well as they have. Florian has found the sleeping place of the white tip reef sharks. The predators are resting on top of a rock. They're actively breathing and are using the current that's flowing by. The same here. This flow passage between the rocks is ideal. This shark species likes companionship. Similar to the lemon sharks, the white tip reef sharks also live in large groups, whether they rest or travel. These types of sleeping places also function as a cleaner station. The cleaner fishes make house calls for them here and clean their mouths and gills, which benefits both of them. What seems to be growing out of the sand in the background, these striped straws are in fact garden eels that can grow up to 15 inches straight out of the sand. They are not on the menu of the sharks. As soon as they sense danger, they withdraw into their tubes in the sand. 
Similar to the white-tip reef sharks, the garden eels also live in the current, which supplies them with nutrition. The white-tip reef sharks have started to hunt. This 15-foot stingray is not impressed. It's busy being used as a taxi cab at the moment, much to the enjoyment of the passengers on its back. The largely bottom-dwelling sharks can reduce their heart frequency during their rest so that they don't use as much oxygen. Not much longer and it's night time. The white-tip reef sharks are starting to become active. They're ready to hunt. There are few places left in the world's oceans with such an abundance of large fishes as are found here around Kokos. There's enough food and space for everybody. This shark has cozied up to a stingray. Rays and sharks are part of the same family, but don't necessarily get along, a scene reminiscent of the story of the Ark in the Bible. Cocos Island's real treasures are found underwater. It's understandable that the Philopatric white tips don't leave the waters around Cocos. This habitat offers everything a shark gourmet would want. Sunsets in the tropics are short and beautiful. Yeah. Time enough to prepare for a night dive. Cameraman Marty is checking his equipment. It needs to be done before each dive, because once they're down there, there's no room for error. Everything has to work. A leap into the unknown. Marty has routinely done this for many years. His camera equipment is handed to him. About 30 feet deep, and they're in the midst of a pack of white tips. The experienced divers have picked the right spot, and the sight of the predators hunting is spectacular. The sharks thoroughly search every corner of this reef. Their agility obviously helps them. Even the large barracuda is part of the pack with the desire to feed. It's very impressive how fast and elegantly the predators maneuver around the jagged corals without hurting themselves. And they certainly aren't careful because sharks have often been observed tearing apart an entire reef block in order to find food. It looks a little bit like a hunting dog that has already the scent of its prey in its nose and follows it into the cave where it has no chance of escaping from the predator. The view from above clearly shows that the white-tip reef sharks hunt together at night. This sea turtle is not part of their meal, but the turtle itself is looking to feed. The barracuda is standing by. No luck. The turtle has things easier down here because reefs don't swim away. The turtle seems happy to graze on the plant growth on the corals. The sharks are getting more anxious as the night goes on. They've started to hunt with more intensity. The 
Sharks don't only use their sense of smell to hunt. They're also in tune to the acoustic and electrical stimuli of their prey. This shark has detected the electric impulses of the place and is successful again. In the coral reefs around Cocos Island, the white-tip reef sharks find an impressive hunting ground. And equally impressive is their ability to hunt cooperatively. Wild sharks. Not only scientists like Samuel Gruber are drawn to these mysterious ocean inhabitants, they continue to fascinate and intrigue all of us.